Hello everyone, uh, it's raining, or my cats are snoring, and this video is for chapter 20 of the astronomy text, uh, and it is going into how galaxies evolve. So we're starting to get into the long past of the universe. How do we know what's going on? with the very earliest things that are occurring in the universe's history. Uh, and we're also getting into, you know, the last few chapters are going to be a whole lot of, this is what we think it is, because we're constantly rediscovering or counter-exampling uh, things that we already thought, finding new ways to adjust our models and new explanations for things so you know as we go through you just understand is that i may tell you stuff and it may be off because new research is out new observations have been made but a lot of this is fairly you know this chapter is fairly okay nothing weird going on so uh this graph I'm showing here, uh, you can see the Big Dipper in the small portion of the image. Let's see if I can get a pointer up. Yeah, you can see the Big Dipper here. And then we zoom into this small patch and zoom in further. And this is what's called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. And you can see a lot of stuff in this. We talked about types of galaxies in Chapter uh, 19. I believe. At least we talked about the Milky Way galaxy and that there were others. But you can look at this. Everything in this image is a galaxy. Except maybe that one right there. That might be a close star. Everything else is a galaxy. And you can see lots of different things here. And they're all different. There's a huge, huge variety of things. And they're at huge distances. They're much uh, scattered throughout the universe. And they reach as far back as, you know, they reach just about to the beginning of the universe. And... All of these factors are close together. This is getting out of astronomy into what's called cosmology, studying the large scale structure and the evolution of the entire universe. Astronomy is more toward, essentially, it's more towards the stuff you can see with your naked eye or with simple equipment. And so it's galaxies and stars and planets. This cosmology is the big outer shell of everything. How does the universe work? And you can see so much. You can see there's a, a spiral galaxy here, and there's ellipticals here, and there's lots of bright young galaxies in blue, and there's lots of old red galaxies. And all of these things you can see are interrelated so yeah we got to talk about the types of galaxies in particular i mentioned them yeah this is the ultra deep field and you can see that there's a spiral galaxy and you can see the spirals in it you can see that there is elliptical galaxies and you can see in the background of this image there are a few things that are a little bit weirder in there here's one when we zoom in on it, it's irregular. Those are the three types, essentially. Now, you can come up with some ideas as what's going on here. This is possibly a collision between galaxies. You can kind of see, like, distinct elements of it. But this is clearly a nice spiral that's formed, and maybe it's got some stuff around it, maybe. Maybe this is just background stuff. And you see an elliptical and it's stuff in the background. It's basically just a ball of stars. 
This is a disc of stars. And this is, I don't know. So spiral galaxies are like the Milky Way. They've got a halo, they've got a bulge, they've got a disc. We can identify those. Right, we can identify what a spiral galaxy, what features of it we see, and they, they look like our feature, the Milky Way. This component is going to have lots and lots and lots of stars of various ages, lots of gas clouds. Most of the material is going to be down in that disk. The spherical component around it, the bulge and the halo, lots of old stars formed when the galaxy formed. Not that many gas clouds. Most of the stuff is going to continue contracting into the disk during the formation. And you can see that in a spiral. There's, you know, the spherical component around the center will have more old stars. The, the arms, the spirals, will have a variety of stars, which will show up blue because of more light from blue, blue stars, more luminous. And I'll have lots of gas and dust. The blue color here is indicating that stars are forming. It's blue, blues. Stars are younger. Red uh, areas are going to be older stars, less star formation. And then there's the motion, right? like we talked in the Milky Way. Stuff in the disk tends to kind of just oscillate through the disk, but orbit the center. Stuff in the spherical component goes every which way on basically random orbits. So we can extend that. There's what's called barred spiral galaxies, which we think the Milky Way is probably a barred spiral. But there's this long linear component running between the spiral arms through the center, a bar of stars. There's what's called the lenticular galaxy, which is, it looks like a, you can see spirals in it, but there's not as much gas and dust. It looks a lot wispier. This will be kind of intermediate between a spiral and an elliptical. And then there's elliptical galaxies, which is basically all spherical. There's no disk component. And the color is going to indicate something about the age. If you're not producing new young stars, you're not going to see any blue stars. And so these elliptical galaxies tend to be red and yellow stars tend to be older star populations. The spirals and the barred spirals tend to be younger. You'll see star formation appearing. So you get irregular galaxies and they can look lots of different ways. You're tending to see in this picture lots of blue stars. So this one is still forming stars. But there's no obvious pattern to this. So there's classes of galaxies. Hubble came up with this arrangement for categorizing the galaxies he is seeing. Uh, the bottom row is your barred spirals. The top row are your regular spirals. And then eventually you get to your, uh, to your ellipticals. So when we look in the sky, galaxies seem to be grouped together. And they're going to be grouped together fairly kind of like stars are. So spiral galaxies tend to show up in small groups, groups of a few dozen galaxies. The Milky Way uh, and the neighboring galaxies around it are all in a small group where some large cloud has condensed down into several different galaxies. Elliptical galaxies are going to usually be in huge, huge clusters, hundreds or thousands of galaxies all in one spot. And they all form about the same time and about the same age. And they will be typically older galaxies. And of course, you'll also see galaxies, you know, elliptical galaxies in small groups. And you can 
look and see maybe some spiral galaxies sitting around here. But in general, elliptical galaxies, big groups, spiral galaxies, small groups. Distance finding. We need to talk about. And we talked about some distance finding up to where we find stars. Stuff in the Milky Way we can position by, you know, where they are in the main sequence, uh, the, the brightness and the period and luminosity relationship for Cepheid variables and other variables. But eventually, we have to get further and further out because it gets harder and harder to identify single stars to do the fitting with. We're starting to look at entire galaxies that to us appear the same size in the sky as single stars or aren't visible to us. So this is the thing. We have to build up from, you know, from smaller distance measuring, right? And the first thing we, we do is build up distances to objects in the solar system, basically radar ranging, timing, using Kepler's laws, that sort of stuff. Once we know the distances in the solar system, then we can find the nearby stars from parallax. We can see how much they move relative to the far away stars, how, what the angles are involved when the Earth moves around the sun. Eventually, that lets us know enough stars that we can do main sequence fitting. We can look at the luminosity and the brightness relationships and reduce distance. And so this kind of leads us to a problem is the further out we go, the less certain we are of the distance because we don't have the ability necessarily to use parallax. We have to kind of trust on brightness and luminosity. And so we need to have a way of knowing what the luminosity is. All right, that is that if we know brightness and luminosity, we can get distance and we can see brightness. But we have to know how the stars function. And we don't necessarily know that. We need something essentially where we know the luminosity without knowing distance. That's what's called a standard candle. And it, it, the term standard candle comes from people making candles that were standardized. They would, they would give off a certain amount of light. And they burned so you could tell how much light was being produced. And you could do, do measurement. The whole, the whole field of metrology is interesting if you're into that sort of thing. And you should consider uh, looking at it a little bit. But this is the sort of thing. Finding, finding a new ruler, in a sense. And so, the piecing together of how stars function in general near us, assuming they're all the same, we can kind of figure out, if there's a cluster of stars, we can figure out how old they are by where the stars turn off on the main sequence, when stars turn into giants. And when we're seeing where they start to turn off, that gives us an idea of how luminous the star is, because the luminosity at that time will depend on the size and will depend on the mass. And that's the sort of thing that, you know, we can fit to our earlier data and figure out how luminous the star should be. But that's not not as accurate as we'd like, and it requires you to be able to resolve particular stars. So knowing the star cluster's distance, you can figure out the luminosity of all the stars in it, and then vice versa. If you can figure out the luminosity, you can figure out the distance. For further away stars, that gets harder and harder to do unless you know something else about the star, like that it varies and it has a period. Uh, we talked about uh, different variable stars in the past. Cepheid variable stars are very, very luminous. 
they tend to be in the more massive stars and the period is a nice relationship and the period and luminosity are correlated so if we know the period we can figure out the luminosity and we can do this all by measuring the period through the brightness at earth over time we can figure out that period and figure out the luminosity so this is a good way of figuring out distances and that lets us get out to the nearer galaxies stuff like uh people wondered if uh the andromeda galaxy actually was a galaxy and hubble found a cepheid variable in the galaxy measured its luminosity by measuring its period and deduced that it had to be outside of our galaxy so there is another form of uh, standard candle right. we talked about uh white dwarf supernovas if you remember uh they are the the remnant of a giant star the the carbon core that's left over there's a limit to the size of the star it's 1.4 solar masses if that core grows any larger it explodes in fusion all the carbon fuses at once essentially the the core the remnant is being held up by electron degeneracy pressure and by the time it reaches that limit the electrons are moving at nearly the speed of light they're no longer pressing outwards as much as they need to be and gravity wins it contracts as soon as it contracts the temperature spikes the carbon ignites and fuses and the whole thing fuses at once and you're left with a supernova and because they occur at the same mass under the same materials they are almost exactly the same luminosity all these white dwarf supernovas are ex almost exactly the same which means when we see them and we can recognize the curve and they're different from the other supernovas we can figure out their brightness and then deduce distance from it so that lets us get very far out into the solar system and we can show some examples uh, white dwarf supernovas let us get most of the way out, about 10 billion light years out. We can still use distances. And go any farther, you have to do some more analysis. We basically have to look for more stuff that gives us distance information. So, uh, Hubble. Hubble here proved that these galaxies were outside of our own. The original idea was that they're nebula. Uh, and people debated this. People didn't know what spiral nebula were. They wondered if they were very far away and galaxies like ours, or if they were just nebula. Hubble managed to measure the distances by finding sea feed variables in these galaxies. And so by doing that, we both extended our measuring distances out. Uh, we didn't have white dwarf supernova at the time, but he managed to get us to measure further and further distances out. And then he started measuring the properties of these galaxies, and in particular, he measured the velocities of galaxies and the distances that he could measure through these Cepheid variables. And if you remember uh, from chapter one, we talked about the expansion of the universe. We talked about the fact that everything is moving away from us. And it's true. All these galaxies, except for the ones very local to us that we're kind of gravitationally bound by, all the faraway galaxies are moving away from us and from each other. This graph that's in front of you is his original plot of velocity and distance and plotting and you can kind of see there's nearby stuff but then the farther away stuff there's obviously an upwards trend 
the more data points we can put to this, the better we can make this linear fit. That's what he did. He looked at the spectra from the galaxies, and he realized that all of these galaxies, virtually all of them, the few that are near us moving towards us are, but almost all of them are moving away. They're all redshifted. And they're more redshifted the further away you are. And so by doing this plot, he figured out that there's a relationship between the velocity and the distance. And the velocity was just a constant times the distance. That's plotted here with some more data. Um, and so what he figured out is a constant that meets this equation based on you know some number of kilometers per second per million light years of distance. And that's what's called Hubble's constant. Now the value of this varies. All right, this is you know with this data, this is the constant you get. There's been some different numbers in the past, but you know the, basically we're pretty certain this matches up gotten enough data from enough sources we have Hubble's constant to some fairly good uh, accuracy and that means we can figure out the distance by measuring the redshift All right we can we can see the specter of light we can see the, the particular peak we're looking for uh, and we can see how much they're shifted and that lets us deduce the velocity and then deduce the distance. So, for the very furthest galaxies, we can basically, you know, what we're measuring for is how redshifted they are. So, this is our measuring thing, is we can start from measuring stuff inside the solar system, and it lets us measure stuff a little further away and a little further away. And all these techniques overlap. Right? And if, if one of them ends up failing, it kind of tells you that something's off about the ones ahead. Right? Like if, if C feed variables weren't well understood, we wouldn't know where the stuff further out would be. But eventually, you know, we can kind of chain together enough stuff that we can make these measurements. And this lets us figure out a couple of other things, like how old the universe is. There's a little bit of stuff going on here. That is, if everything's moving away from us, there is a limit to how far away we can see. And then the stuff that's moving, it's moving fast enough that the light has trouble getting to us in the first place. It'll be essentially too red shifted. The expansion rate seems uniform, and there doesn't seem to be a center to anything. So there's a limit to how big it can be, based a limit to how much we can see based on how long the light has time to get there. But there's also a limit based on how what's the furthest thing away we could see that the light can still get to us, because it's you know the redshift is still the light's still able to get to us in time. And this, when we look at the universe, we don't have any reason to think that there's something weird going on. Everything looks about the same everywhere. No matter where we are, same laws of physics apply. We get the same observations, roughly. Basically, there doesn't seem to be a center, no preferred spot, no edges. The matter is just everywhere. And so... We can kind of figure out that the furthest away stuff gives us a measure for age of the universe. And Hubble's constant is, is kind of a measure of that age. Right? The idea is age is based on the distance the light has to travel and the velocity of the galaxy having time to get where it is when it sends a light. 
And so that ends up being one over Hubble's constant. So that gives us an idea of the age of the galaxy. Expansion affects these measurements, right? Is essentially light gets sent and it gets to Earth, but the galaxy has moved since then. All right. There, there's not just a redshift because it's moving away. There's a redshift because of the actual expansion of the universe itself. So often when we talk about stuff very, very far away, we don't even bother to talk with distances. We talk about look back time. How old is the light when we see it? Because by the time it gets to us, for the very furthest away things, there's been enough time for the galaxy to move even further. All right, so there's an underlying cosmological redshift, not just a redshift due to the motion of the galaxy, but a redshift due to the expansion of the universe. And so... All of this is implying that there is a horizon. There's a place or time before which we can't see anything. There might be stuff out there, but we can't see it. And this cosmological horizon is a horizon in time. There can be stuff behind it, but the light doesn't have time to get to us. Whew. That concludes chapter 20. Like I said, we're going to be going through this a bit to um, to you know to the to the extent that stuff that I tell you that stuff is probably rock solid. All right, is there's a Hubble constant? It lets you estimate the age of the universe. There's redshift. But the actual values for the numbers, how old the universe actually is, yeah, we get better and better estimates as we find older and older things. And you know, there's always some concern about our measurements and always going back and checking our measurements. So as we go on, the next chapter and the next chapter is going to get less and less certain. About what we're talking about. So you're going to have to be more willing to go find out what the newest information is. Anyway, I will talk to you in the next video.